Let us pray. Holy God, your blessings are abundant and your wisdom exceeds our grasp. Fill us with your spirit as we hear your word this day, that we may be, we may be justice seekers and peacemakers, sharing your life among those who are forgotten, weak, or persecuted, and revealing to all your glory. Amen. The, reading, the Old Testament reading today comes from Micah, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you, and what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I have brought you from up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with the Lord your God. The composer of today's anthem is a man named Arvo Pert, uh, a composer from Estonia, and he wrote his rendition of today's gospel reading, this reading from Matthew, using a style of composition he created called tintinabuli. It's named after the sounds of bells. Uh, here's a very knowledgeable description of this music style, um, and I can tell you that this music is characterized <clears throat> by two types of voice, the first of which arpeggiates the tonic triad, and the second of which moves diatonically in stepwise motion. So I know Stephanie and Tom and probably the choir now understand what that means. Uh, for the rest of us, one, I would point out in your bulletin insert, Stephanie has done a beautiful job of describing this process, but basically, Parrot was inspired by Gregorian chant and by uh, medieval Christian music, which he studied deeply. And he strips down music to sets of three, these triads, and very sparse chords. So when you hear the anthem this morning, you'll hear our choir singing these simple triads, the sopranos and the uh, tenors, as Tom on the organ and the basses and the altos build notes below them building them a house to live in, as it were. Stephanie sent me a copy of the uh, score that all of these folks have in front of them, and I will tell you, it um, looks very deceptively simple. There are whole notes and consistent rhythms. There's lots of rests. There's space on the page. But that score cannot capture the challenge of this piece but also the tensions and the depth of this music. Peart's compositions are deeply spiritual. He was an Orthodox Christian. They leave space for mystery, mixing silence and breath into step-by-step -step formula. Peart describes this composition style. Tintinabulation is an area I sometimes wander into when I am searching for answers in my life, my music, my work. In my dark hours, I have the certain feeling that everything outside this one thing has no meaning. The complex and many-faceted only confuses me, and I must search for unity. What is it, he asks, what is it this one thing and how do I find my way to it? Jesus' words today in our gospel reading are themselves very sparse, very deceptively simple. Jesus uses his own formula, blessed are for they. 
He strips down the power and the hope of the incarnation to a list we now call the Beatitudes. Much like the words from our Micah reading today that Nathaniel read for us just now, this scripture is at the heart of who we are called to be and at the very soul of who our God ever proves to be. Listen again to these words Jesus spoke on that mount some 2,000 years ago. Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Here to ask, what is it, this one thing, and how do I find my way to it? Jesus' words are simple and straightforward in so many ways, and so too are Micah's today. I'll never forget seeing these words, embarrassingly enough, it may have been for the first time, but for whatever reason, it was the first time it clicked when I was a young adult. These words from Micah 6, 8, and I thought, oh my God, there it is. All of it packed neatly into one beautiful verse. God has told you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I haven't really changed my mind since then. It's still beautifully packed into one verse. What is it, this one thing, and how do I find my way to it? Today's lectionary is an embarrassment of riches, and I chose to read that Micah passage along with this beautiful Beatitudes passage from Matthew. But the Corinthians text for today, our epistle reading, would have been our epistle reading, is also, to my mind, Paul at his absolute best, It's 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. Paul describes in this passage the foolishness of the cross. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. The Beatitudes and Micah pare things down to the most basic and the most fundamental, justice, kindness, walking humbly with God, Or in the Beatitudes, hope and God's blessing for the weak, the mourning, the one striving for peace and mercy. And then Paul's text reminds us that these things are very often in tension with this world. Sometimes we need to strip everything down to their most basic, most fundamental, most straightforward forms in order to truly see them. Sometimes we need to create breaths and rests in our music and in our lives and in our thoughts in order for God to fill them. And sometimes when we pare things down to the simple, it allows us to better see their contrasts and feel their tensions. It's remarkable how just three notes in a triad can build this tension. 
Our world, it is complicated. It is not black and white. We are not simply good or evil. Things are not always this or that. Even so, at times, if we're honest with ourselves and our world, we can see and name God's yes and no. The anthem this morning builds to a large and clear yes, right? It culminates in an amen. The tension is made clear by each sparse phrase as it builds and builds until it is catapulted into a harmonious and resounding amen, a yes to Jesus' words. At times when we clear away the thousands of voices and influences and spins and justifications, The foolishness of the cross becomes clear and becomes clearly in tension with our world. In contrast to the power-seeking and warmongering and loopholing and cruelty of so much of the world's noise, and I do not need to name kinds of noise for you to know how much noise there is, we are called to push back by seeking justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly. And when that kind of living finds its way through the noise, when God's foolishness and weakness rubs up against the power and wisdom of the world, something truly beautiful breaks through. Tension, it would seem, might be challenging, but it need not be ugly. Quoting Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, Pastor Jill Duffield tells this story of a woman courageously facing tension at the site of a lynching. Stevenson, she says, founded the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, memorialization of the victims of lynching. And at the memorial, there are jars of dirt dug from each of the sites where these murders were known to have occurred. Stevenson shares the story of an African-American woman who participated in this project. She was on her hands and knees by the side of the road, digging up dirt and placing it in a jar at one of these sites, when a white man in a truck slowed down and looked at her. He drove past, and then he stopped, and he turned around. And he stopped by her and asked her what she was doing. She said she felt compelled to tell him the truth, despite being afraid. He got out of the truck and asked if he could help her. She offered him the trowel, and he declined so that he could dig with his hands. Together they put dirt in a jar. She noticed tears streaming down his face, and she asked if he was okay, and he said, He was afraid maybe his ancestors may have participated in this very lynching she was memorializing. She cried with him. They took a picture of each other holding the jar, memorializing a moment of unexpected understanding, hope, reconciliation, tension turned to beauty, a moment of blessed mourning, mercy, hunger and thirst for righteousness that came as a result of two people each in their own way and time, in their ordinary lives, haltingly trying to stop and do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. Parent asks, what is it, this one thing, and how do I find my way to it? In seeking first the one thing, in allowing our North Star to be the foolishness of the cross, in naming God's deceptively simple call to see the struggling, powerless, and grieving as blessed, in naming God's deceptively simple call to seek justice, love kindness, and walk with humility, in finding our way to these things, we may cause or find tension But friends, it's a beautiful kind of tension. Let's not be afraid of God's call. Let's not be afraid of simple truths. 
Let's open ourselves to the rests and breaths that only God can fill. And let's go into the world ready to build the kind of tension that breaks into a resounding echo of God's glorious amen.